Cool stage. Yeah. <laughs> So a key element of this new transportation landscape has been the emphasis on moving away from car ownership to this more shared model. Raj, could you talk a little bit about how, how Lyft plans to do that, considering that at least at the current time, the company still relies on people who do own their cars? Yeah, so I think that, first of all, we're sitting at a, a point in time that is unprecedented where um, this massive industry of automobiles has been built, um, and it happened faster than almost anything from 1900 to 1913. I think it was like 10, 10 to 15 million cars that were built. Um, and we built our entire world, all of our cities around vehicles. And it's been tremendous in terms of the benefits, but there's been some downsides around congestion, around emissions, um, and what we're realizing is the more vehicles that exist, the more congestion there is. You can't just keep adding roads to it. There's two and a half billion people over the next 10 years moving into cities, and we're not on a path with the current car ownership model to satisfy people's transportation needs. So it's not a nice to have option in our opinion, it is a must have option in doing it. And it just so happens that it's also a great economic opportunity for consumers that if you look at a car, in America, it's used 4% of the time. 96% of the time, it's sitting around and not being used. It's the second largest expense after housing. You spend more money in the US on a car than you do on food. So you don't use it that much. You're spending a lot on it. It's causing issues in the cities. There's something that needs to change there, which is why we believe shared rides, certainly electric vehicles, all of that will contribute to this. And there's a new model, the same way that music uh, has been changed from ownership to access. Video entertainment has been changed. We think that car and, and transportation is now in that zone as well. Bodil, is, do, you, do you agree with that? Is that that's essentially the the emphasis of, of M, is that correct? Totally, I uh, absolutely concur with uh, a lot of what uh, Raj is saying. I think um, at the heart of it, there are still not alternatives enough out there for people to give up their cars. And especially when we talk uh, about urban consumers or people living in cities, they still keep their cars because there is no alternative. And here, uh, we as providers need to really understand consumers and what they use the car for. So there are so many different user cases. And when we started to now develop a new concept for global expansion, we really looked hard into that. And we feel that the, the short rides, the e-hailing, the ride sharing, that is responding to a kind of a now need. Um, whereas we are focusing on actively providing an alternative to ownership to make people be ready to give up their cars. So therefore, also taking out cars of the equation because there is simply too many physical vehicles in the cars right in the cities right now. Yeah, and I mean you mentioned taking cars out of the equation. So Lyft of course has bike share and scooter share. Yeah. I realize M just earlier this year unveiled that you would be doing a ride hailing network, but do you do you have alternative modes of transportation on the on the horizon? We, uh, first, we are really set on doing something that consumers love. So uh, we are not backed up with by a venture cap. We are uh, owned by Volvo Cars. So the, the objective now is just to do it right. It's not like a massive, uh, you know, pushing out vehicles to prove something. It is actually doing right by the consumers. But we will be totally open for partnerships. We believe in partnerships. And there are certainly more parts of the transportation um, ecosystem where we would love to tap in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, correct me if I'm wrong, but Volvo is partnered with, with Uber around autonomous driving. But I suppose that doesn't affect M. 
Uh, at this point, uh, nothing affects M apart from the opportunity we have to impact the way cars are built. Okay. And that is uh, one of the tasks that, that also we have to provide insights to Volvo Cars about this new type of consumer that actively have decided not to own a car. And that's very different from uh, where uh, automotive companies come from. You know, Volvo cars have been around for 90 years, developing and building cars for one person to, to buy and use. So, it was earlier this month, or last month actually, when Ford bought electric scooter company Spin. I'm wondering, what, what's your take on, on electric scooters? Well, um, the other day I was uh, on my way to my hairdresser and there was this young dad who slided up next to the school uh, with the uh, scooter. Mm -hmm. And I can clearly see that that is very uh, attractive. Uh, so the, there is definitely something in the last mile. Um, but I'm a walker. Um, I walk everywhere. And I kind of don't like tripping over the scooters outside my door. Neither do I uh, kind of very much appreciate being run down by <laughs> scooter drivers as they use the walkway. So there is. I, I put it like this, we are early in the phase. There needs to be a lot of alternatives tested, and that I embrace wholeheartedly. Uh, but there's also um, you know, a lot of stuff that needs to be figured out in order things to be flawless. Mm -hmm. But Raj, I mean, Lyft, I mean, scooters and bikes are definitely part of Lyft's platform. How do you kind of envision all of these forms of transportation coexisting? Yeah. So. Lyft and I think any large scale transportation as a service provider has to be multimodal. The consumer has demanded it. So we did a test. Um, a couple months ago, we had a promotion in the US. We said, ditch your car. Mm. And at the time, we didn't have a full multimodal solution. So we put together car sharing from Zipcar. We had bike share. At the time, we hadn't closed uh, Motivate, which is the largest bike share now, is part of Lyft in the United States. And uh, we added in ride sharing, of course. And we put all together as a package. We thought that there would be a couple thousand people that would sign up. We had 150,000 people sign up within a week hmm. to ditch their car and to try putting together all these alternatives, which today are not seamless in doing it. So, we are moving from a ride-sharing company to a full transportation provider. And that also gets, that includes, especially in Europe, it's so important, which is transit. Transit is the lifeblood of a city. It is the most efficient way to move large groups of people from point A to point B. And it has to be part of the solution. Even in Lyft today, you can find nearby transit information. In fact, we use a, a European company, Traffy, who's built a lot of the data management to help us on that. So uh, we view it as whether you know, you're trying to go less than a, uh, one or two kilometers, you could walk for sure. You could also, and we'll recommend you walk in the application actually. Um, you could also use a scooter, you could use a bike share, um, and you could use ride sharing. And we're seeing that people are trading off and transit uh, in their everyday use and putting it together. So it's, I think you're going to see 2019 where it's going to get significantly easier by the end of 2019 to stitch all of these modes together than it was right now. OK. And how does autonomous fit into this? So you know, a good question that people ask is, why autonomous? Are we doing it just because AI is here and it's the, right, you know, it's the next big hot thing that everyone's talking about? If we think about our business around ride sharing, Every single element that a consumer cares about is impacted positively by autonomous. So on safety, we know that something like 94% of accidents are caused by human error. Mm -hmm. And so if you can reduce that significantly, which we believe in the long run as the technology develops, that will have an impact in doing it. Two is the cost of transportation. My guess is that the industry can lower prices by more than half of what they pay today when you have an autonomous vehicle at scale. They're right now expensive, but they're going to get cheaper over the years in doing it. Another piece is the experience. Cars have been developed and built around the driver. Mm -hmm. Cars have been developed and built to be the least common denominator to do all the things that you want to do in a day. Cars are going to move towards the airline industry and become cabins. And you're going to have a sleep lift 
a work lift, an entertain lift. And there's gonna be all sorts of different things you can do there because you're not constrained by the steering wheel and the controls and the driver. You can use all of that space. And of course, another piece that's important is shared rides. Right. Um, today, Lyft, 35% of rides are shared uh, on the Lyft platform, which did exist a couple years ago, but it's super important. Otherwise, we're not gonna reduce the number of cars. Um, and if we can redesign a car so there are compartments for people that can have their privacy and safety and security, that's something that we can also bring forth with autonomous. So do you think autonomous will have, or wh what effect do you think autonomous will have on traffic and congestion? So I think um, a key point, as I mentioned, is it's not enough, in our opinion, to just have autonomous cars. We believe there are three factors that the world has to move towards. Autonomous, electric, which addresses the emissions problem, but it's also an economic reason to do it. It is cheaper to run an electric car in a fleet like ours. Maybe not for a consumer, but it's cheaper for a fleet. And then shared. You need to have shared rides. Cities need to promote shared rides. Otherwise, you can't guarantee that the number of vehicles will go down with autonomous. So all three are important to bring together for the next generation solution. Okay. Bodil, is autonomous or electric shared autonomous vehicles part of M's future? Uh, it will definitely be part as that technology becomes available. Um, our global Volvo Cars global CEO today said that um, we shouldn't overestimate the difficulties in introducing um, uh, autonomous drive. Um, I think the the uh, Raj spoke to a lot of the benefits of autonomous driving when it's finally there. Uh, I think also in a business like the one we are looking upon, there are other user cases which are really attractive, like thinking that cars would actually go out of your physical or visible space, like come to you um, when you need it and then quietly and safely go away and park. So imagine uh, autonomous drive also being used in, in other situations, uh, not, uh, not only to drive yourself or being in the car, but just as a support uh, to you. Because I think finally we would like to see less cars around us and just yeah. have like more space. Right, absolutely. Yeah, and I mean, so there was a study in, in San Francisco last month that said, um, that, that Uber and Lyft contributed to more than 50% of the increase in traffic since, uh, since 2010. So would you say that autonomous is part of maybe, is part of Lyft's effort to reduce that, just kind of what you were saying around these shared electric autonomous rides and maybe scooters and bikes also fitting into there? Um, I think that integrating multiple modes of transportation is important. Uh, so this is, we've also seen that people are choosing bike sharing and scooters, um, and that's a way to also get large automobiles uh, off the street as well. And then we're, uh, we have a goal that by 2020, more than half of all lift rides will be shared. And we're at 35%, and we have line of sight to get there. The way to get there is to have, the more people that use a service, the more density there is, the more likely you can pick up people along the way. The other thing we've done is introduce the concept of walking into the ride, which is uh, you know, amazing. People didn't think about this, but uh, the idea is that if you can get several different people along the route to walk, you don't have to do a point-to-point -point detour. And you can make it a lot more efficient, and you can lower the cost, and also lower the number of vehicles that are there. Mm -hmm. But you know, as far as there are studies that come out in both directions in terms of what the impact is on a city, so I don't think we fully understand what it is. There's a lot of variables that are there. Right. But the most important thing is that we all do have to work on solutions to reduce the number of vehicles. Everyone is in agreement on that. And I mean, how do you generally incentivize people to take these shared rides as opposed to just requesting their, their own individual either Lyft ride or M ride? So, you know, um, the economics are powerful. Your Lyft ride, if it's shared, can be 25 to 30 percent below the price of a normal ride. That's probably the biggest driver that's there. But what we're finding is when two human beings get in a car, they stop looking at their phone and they start talking to each other. And there's actually, human beings are social animals. And what we're finding is that they're having a pleasant experience in a shared ride with someone that they don't necessarily know. 
and that's another factor that people are, are actually enjoying the concept of sharing a ride with another human being. Amazing, but it's true. I can't say I agree. <laughs> I generally don't like sharing rides, but you maybe... You may be an introvert. I, I, am. <laughs> I am, it's true. Uh, but Bodil, how do you, how do you kind, of, kind of see shared rides fitting into this and incentivizing people to take them? People like me, maybe, who just, yeah. who just want to look at yeah. their phones I, and not I don't talk agree. to anyone. I mean, go to any restaurants, and even <laughs> people knowing each other, they are sitting fiddling with their phones. So I don't believe in, in the social aspect of share ride. I do believe that share ride is the biggest problem because autonomous won't uh, deal with the number of cars as long as we are still one person in a car. So I think there is a fundamental shift of understanding and supporting people to understand the different modes. And that is a very, very important thing. And what is really needs to be bumped up is good public transport. That's the, that's the, the biggest part of it, because it's, it's that number of people that now live in, in the metro, in the big cities around the world is just gigantic. Um, I think um, also there is, you know, uh, um, a situation today where a lot of the larger cities get such an influx of cars um, to serve the, uh, the cities during daytime, so that is even more of a problem. Um, for us, it's, it's really about enabling uh, a part of uh, our behavior that is, uh, we see, not yet uh, a good alternative out there. And I would argue that uh, there are uh, alternatives for what we want to provide, you know, to become an alternative to ownership. We have tested everything that is out there, and it's so clear that, that it's, we are still early days, and that is why we also believe that even a small um, actor like, like M can provide something as long as you understand something critical about the consumer and address something that is, you know, making them reconsider their current behaviors. Yeah, and I mean, M is definitely a bit of a, of a latecomer to, to ride hailing. I mean, how do you plan to differentiate yourself from the likes of Lyft and Uber and the ones that have really yeah. already gained well, quite a lot of market yeah, share? Yeah, well, the first thing is that we aim not to compete in, in the areas where you are strongest, the, uh, the, uh, the e-hailing and the, the short trips. We see that that is very, very uh, much um, answered to, those needs are answered to. What we see is the way you use your car when owning one is a very different from the one that is driver supported or um, yeah, is primarily driver supported or even the, the shorter rides. You, uh, you use cars in very different situations when owning one. It, and there, that behavior is what we are really digging deep into. That's also something we have really a, a lot of uh, experience on given where we, um, what uh, our owners have been doing for 90 years. And then when looking at the alternatives, we see that, that there is very rudimentary services out there. They are, uh, and I think people don't give up their cars because there's still nothing good enough, you know? Um, it's both in terms of dependability, uh, to really become dependable, but then it's also, you know, what do you expect from a really good service? It's not just a car from a certain time. You have bigger expectations if you are ready to give up your own car. Okay, but so, but you were saying that that really you're you're targeting people who are who are owning their cars. But I mean, Lyft and Uber drivers they often own their cars. Granted, like Lyft and Uber have some leasing leasing options available. But I guess yeah, could you elaborate a little bit more on how on how it'll, it'll be different? Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of us uh, use um, the e-hailing and ride-sharing services and own a car. Still, right. we have been uh, we have done so many um, studies, and people all over the world, actually, in, in all the metros, are now at the place where they rather keep their own car parked uh, and use another service because they know that the um, 
um, the difficulty of finding a new parking space would they come back after having used their own car. So there is something like to totally locked in, but they need their car for certain things in their life. Mm -hmm. Could be their hobbies, could be their children. It's about life ultimately and what you do in your life. What are the things that are important to you? Uh, your family, mm, children, uh, hobbies. Um, things you, you do, uh, go and see people. You, you pick up several you know, kids on the way to uh, hockey training, or you go and stay with friends for a while. So a lot of the user cases, you actually want to, to bring your own car, not go with a driver, for example. Mm. And you keep your own car for those, uh, those times or those events. And it's so few, it's totally, as Raj say, the, the private cars aren't used. It's just, they are just standing idle for a very, very short time. But people need that certainty, or like they want to, to know that if I need a car, I, I need to get one. Mm -hmm. uh, and also it's very, um, you know, they're not uh, really on the level of um, service that you can expect. Okay, so I mean, so it sounds like your target your target consumer for, for M's Ride Hailing Network is people who already own their cars but maybe don't want to use them quite as often. Also people that do not use them but want the freedom that a car can provide. Okay. But I mean, but couldn't they also just use Uber or Lyft? Because there are different behaviors. Because we don't always... I use um, Uber and Lyft and other for certain uh, rides. But I use, uh, I don't, I gave up my car when I got this job, so I can't say I, I have my, but I use other services now for other ways of moving around. Okay. Okay. And I know that this is probably a few years out, well, at least, at least a few years out, but let's get into flying taxis. Um, Raj, I know, so you're one of your competitors, Uber, that's something that, that they're talking about. What's, what's your stance on flying taxis, especially as you think of this like multimodal platform? Yeah, I mean, I think the concept is definitely interesting. The, the science seems to be there. I think that we're far away from the entire system to be able to work at a price point noise issues, and then of course there are rights of way issues that have to be resolved. So I would bet that we'll see self-driving cars scale up before we'll see flying cars scale up uh, as an opportunity. In fact, one of the things is we are live uh, in Las Vegas with the largest uh, autonomous self-driving fleet right now. Mm -hmm. um, we've done over 20,000 rides and consumers love it. It's been rated about 4.9, five out of five stars. Um, over 90% would come back and do it again. So we're seeing in 2019, it'll be a slow rollout, but it's starting, self-driving cars are starting to come out. And one point around self-driving is that it's a lot more economical for a service like Lyft to launch it because self-driving cars are not going to work in all conditions, all time. Uh, when they start. They can basically do block by block, city by city. There are certain scenarios they can work. So we, when a consumer hails a ride, we can decide if it's safe to send out an autonomous vehicle or to send out a driver. It's like a hybrid network, just like if you're a 4G operator and you have 5G, you can put a few 5G towers because you know you can fall back on 4G. We have drivers and autonomous. So we will see that roll out well before we see things like flying cars, in my opinion. It's fair. Bodil? Probably true. <laughs> Although it would be cool. It would be really cool, but yeah, yeah, we'll, see yeah. If, we'll see if we get there. Um, all right, I'm going to take a few questions from the audience, thanks to good old Slido. Um, so what about the role of insurance in, in self-driving vehicles and liability? Yeah. How do you so, like that? Uh, you know, there are going to be massive changes, first of all, just to take a broad view on this. Transportation in the US alone is a $2 trillion opportunity. When you look at all the businesses that are going to be impacted by the move to self-driving, insurance, um, auto financing, um, even things like organ donation, uh, because there's less accidents, there's less organs that are going to be donated. When you add up all those effects, it's another $2.1 trillion is what we estimate. 
which includes a fundamental restructuring of insurance. Because right now, our premiums and the entire industry is geared towards a relatively high accident rate, which we are not going to see going forward into this new world. So every industry, gas stations, auto repair, insurance, everything is going to be restructured in this new world. And we're going to see insurance have to change and accommodate as well. I think the liability question is going to remain just like most liability, product liability questions that are there. Who's responsible for the product? You know, and, it's a, and if it is Lyft who owns the vehicle, we're going to look back and say, just like in a car, where in the supply chain was there a problem, if there was a problem with an autonomous vehicle? And that responsibility will be there amongst the shared parties in going forward. So I don't think there's any magical difference uh, that's there. It's that now you are getting a service, and whenever you consume a service, there is a liability question in the provider of that service. It's either them or the supply chain that's responsible. It'll be the same thing. Okay. Yes. Any, any thoughts to add? Or? Well, <clears throat> Volvo Cars said some years ago that the day that Volvo Cars will be fully autonomous, Volvo will take liability. And I think um, from a safety point of view, I think it's interesting already today when we talk to the cities that are now our aim uh, to launch, they see very positively to get a service with Volvo Cars that has so much higher um, safety um, because of the the technology that we have been in, in uh, developing over many, many years, and that is actually part of the, uh, the journey towards autonomous. Yes. And so when, when launching these new technologies, whether it's um, ride-hailing or autonomous, what are your, what are your conversations like with, with cities? And we'll start with you, Bodil. They are uh, amazingly open-minded, uh, and they do see the situation with uh, the, co the complex um, situation today with transportation, with uh, a lot of cars coming into the cities, uh, private cars being underused, uh, and they want to see more options. And m most importantly, they want um, providers like us uh, and others to work with them. And that, I think, is, is absolutely paramount because it's such a big, big change we are, uh, that we have ahead of us. And they all state that we've been trying to build ourselves out of this now for 50 years, mm -hmm. and it's not working. So we need to find uh, different ways. And, and in, this, um, in this, for me, it's really critical to be humble about what you do and not just flood a city with another 400 cars that is you know, already really, really um, weighing under the, the, uh, the, the burden of too many cars at the same time, at the same price. But, but really listen to what, what is the consumer looking for? What, how can we help? What is broken that is not yet uh, solved? And talking and working closely with cities. Raj, what's, what's your approach to, to working with cities? So um, our founder, Logan, the CEO, um, had worked when he was in college and people were out at beer parties, he was actually on the transportation board of the city, trying to help them figure out how to run buses more efficiently. So it's been in our DNA to really partner and work closely with the city and try to solve this problem because we can't do it alone. There's no way. It impacts the community so much. So in 2012, when we introduced peer-to-peer -peer ride sharing, it wasn't allowed in any city or any state in the country. And we had to work collaboratively to get all 50 states on board and work closely with every city to help redefine what the rules are. It took a while. This time we're seeing with scooters and bikes um, and other forms of transportation and autonomous, we're seeing a very open and fast moving city, much faster than was in 2012 because they recognize it's not just about innovation, they have a problem to solve. They know their city's growing, they can't have more cars, and they need to work with companies uh, to solve that. So we're seeing a very different stance and we've been absolutely working with them on, for example, scooters every time we're working with them on permits and on helping them understand how to roll that out. Uh, we view the same thing around autonomous as well. So it is, I think, the entire industry, whether you're a startup 
or a large auto manufacturer has realized you need to be working together on this. It's, it's not an option to be rogue. <laughs> Absolutely. We are unfortunately out of time, but thank you for joining me. Thank, thank you. you. Thank 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 you.